Hi everybody and welcome to Chem Talk, where today we'll be talking about polar covalent bonds. We will first be talking about electronegativity. There are lessons posted on Chem Talk's website about periodic trends and electronegativity, so those are super helpful on this topic as well. And there is a lesson about polar covalent bonds as well on Chem Talk's website, so you can look at that too for more notes. So, electronegativity. Electronegativity is the relative ability of an atom to attract electrons to itself when it is part of a chemical compound. In a chemical reaction, elements with higher electronegativities tend to take the most electrons. These elements of higher electronegativities are found in the upper right corner of the periodic table. Elements with lower electronegativities tend to lose electrons in chemical reactions and are found in the lower left corner of the periodic table. In general, Electronegativity increases from left to right across a period in the periodic table. Conceptually, this is because as an atom gets closer to a full valence shell, it has a stronger pull for these electrons because it's so close, it just needs a few more electrons, so it has a greater desire to obtain those electrons. Electronegativity also decreases going down a group. Conceptually, this is because the distance between the outer shell or the valence shell and the nucleus containing the protons is decreasing. And the proteins, the protons is what attracts these electrons. So as the distance between the outer shell and the nucleus with the protons is decreasing, so does the level of pull from the protons is also decreasing. So hence the atom's electronegativity is decreasing. Electronegativity of, of an atom theoretically and technically is not fixed and simple. It can be measured experimentally and can depend on the chemical environment, like which other atoms are present, and how relatively electronegative they are. But when different measures for measuring the electronegativity of an atom are compared, they all tend to give similar values for an element. So, the electronegativity values of an element was proposed by Linus Pauling. He's back again. He created a scale with a value of 4.0 given to the most electronegative element, which is fluorine and the electronegativity of all the other elements are scaled relative to this value. It is important to notice that the elements most important to organic chemistry, which are carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, have some of the highest electronegativity values on the periodic table as well. Also keep note that the noble gases are excluded because these atoms do not share electrons with other atoms since they have a full valence shell. So let's get back to talking about what we came here to talk about, the polar covalent bond. So how does electronegativity relate to bonding and bond type? Well, ionic bonding is a complete transfer of one or more electrons from one atom to the other. For example, with NaCl, where Na, sodium, completely gives one electron to Cl, or chloride. Covalent bonding is when electrons are shared between two atoms. For example, with Cl2, where the one chloride and another chloride, they share electrons. Pure covalent bonding is when these electrons are equally completely equally shared, whereas polar covalent bonding is when these electrons are unequally shared. The more strongly an atom attracts the electron in its bonds, or the greater the electronegativity it has, the greater it will, the, elect, the atom will be pulling these electrons. Now, how do you know which, which type of bond it is? Well, that's when the electronegativity comes back into a play. Whether a bond is ionic, nonpolar covalent, or polar covalent can be estimated by looking at the difference in electronegativity of the two bonded atoms. When the difference is small or zero, the bond is nonpolar covalent. When the difference is very, very large, the bond is either polar covalent or ionic. Generally, if the difference is relatively smaller, as if it's less than 0.4, then the bond is pure covalent. If the if the valid difference is between 0.4 and 1.8, then the bond is polar covalent, and if it's greater than 1.8, then the bond is ionic. In the idea of an ionic bond, atoms either beca become completely positively charged or completely negatively charged. For example, if we think again about NaCl, Na completely donates an electron to Cl, so Na becomes positive and Cl becomes negative. But in polar covalent bond, both atoms still kind of hold on to these electrons. So that brings into the idea of partial charges. So an atom becomes either partially negatively charged or partially positively charged because it's just a little bit extra of an electron gain or a little bit extra of an electron loss. So we can represent this by the lowercase Greek delta, which is used to indicate partial charge. So a partial negative is drawn with the lowercase delta and a minus sign, and a partial positive is drawn with a lowercase delta and a positive sign.
So now we can look at an example of CCl4. So first we can draw the Lewis structure of this. And oftentimes, you don't actually need to know the electronegativity values to estimate whether it's going to be partial negative or partial positive when a covalent bond. So we know C and Cl will have form a covalent bond, but how do we know which one is going to be partial positive and partial negative? Well, Cl is further to the right on the periodic table than to C. So Cl will, for, will attract the electrons or pull the electrons a little bit more than carbon will. So we know that the carbon will have the partial positive and all four CLs will have the partial negatives. A really important tool with covalent bonding or polar covalent bonding is we can visualize where the electrons are based on a electrostatic map where red represents the electron rich regions and blue represents the electron poor regions. So for if we have CH3F, for example, we know that fluoride being the most electronegative atom there is, is going to pull the electrons the most. So that is going to be our red region, where hydrogen is one of the least electronegative atoms in this example, carbon being more electronegative than hydrogen. So that's going to be the electron poor region with three hydrogens. And in between is carbon, where so it's going to be neither electron poor or electron rich, somewhere in the middle, so we'll label that green. So this is a really good way of representing where the electrons really are in this electrostatic map. So we can also draw an arrow showing the electron-rich region, which is also very useful, where it's going to be an arrow pointing towards the electron-rich region with a hash through the bottom of the arrow, kind of representing the, the electron-poor region, which is, can be considered kind of like positive. So it's meant to look like a plus sign. So for our CH3F, we can draw it pointing up towards the F. So overall, there is no clear-cut division between covalent and ionic bonds. In a pure non-covalent bond, the electrons are held on average exactly halfway between the atoms. In a polar bond, the electrons have been dragged slightly towards one end. How far does this dragging have to go be before the bond counts as ionic? There's no real answer to that. It's just important to have this understanding of types of bonds so that we can approximately see where the electrons are and how they're distributed. This becomes crucial with chemical reactions between molecules to see how this electron distribution changes and how molecules interact with each other. So a summary of what we have learned. Covalent bonds form when electrons are shared between atoms and are attracted by the nuclei of both atoms. In polar covalent bonds, the electrons are shared, or in pure covalent bonds, sorry, the electrons are shared equally. In polar covalent bonds, the electrons are shared unequally as one atom exerts a stronger force of attraction on the on the electrons than the other. The ability of an atom to attract a pair of electrons in a chemical bond is called as electronegativity. The difference in electronegativity between two atoms determines how polar a bond will be. In a diatomic model with two identical atoms, there's no difference in electronegativity, so the bond is nonpolar and pure covalent. When the electronegativity difference is large, as in the case between metals and nonmetals, the bonding is considered either, it's either gonna be polar covalent or it's gonna be ionic. So now let's move on to some examples. So in this first example, in question number one, we're gonna identify which atom is partial negative and which atom is partial positive. So these are all polar covalent bonds, I'll tell you this right now. So let's try to figure out which is gonna be partial negative and which is gonna be partial positive. So, for ox so in the first one, we have an OH bond. We have two OH bonds, essentially. So oxygen is further to the right and has almost a full valence shell compared to hydrogen with its one proton. So oxygen has more protons, it's going to have a greater pull, it's also very close to having a full valence shell, whereas hydrogen has only one proton. So oxygen is going to be much more electronegative, it's going to be the partial negative, and the two hydrogens will be partial positives. Between hydrogen and fluorine, well, we know fluorine is the most electronegative atom, so that's just going to be partial negative right off the bat, and our hydrogen is going to be partial positive. And this third one, let's only look at the CN bond here. So carbon and nitrogen. This is where the using the periodic table really comes into play, because that's really what's going to help you understand which one is going to be more electronegative. Um, so if you have a periodic table handy, you can see that nitrogen is further to the right than carbon, just by one, it's the next atom on the list. So it's close to having that valence shell full, it, it will have a greater electronegativity value than carbon. So that's going to be our partial negative, and carbon is going to be a partial positive. This one though, with carbon and nitrogen, 
is so close to being um since they're so close together it's probably honestly close to being a pure covalent bond but there is that bit of electronegativity difference so it will be polar covalent so now this next example this next example looks really crazy it's gonna it's like it looks like a huge molecule but really we're trying to see compa uh, we're gonna let's draw another molecule and replace the hydrogen on the left carbon with a fluorine so what we're really trying to see is which of which bond is going to be more polarized well first let's try to assign our partial negatives and partial positives so on the left molecule the left carbon is going to be our partial negative it's going to have a partial negative on it just because it's going to be more electronegative than the, than the two hydrogens it's bonded to the right ca carbon is going to have a partial positive because it's bonded to, a double bonded to an oxygen which is has a greater electronegativity than the carbon. For to our right molecule, well, that left carbon has fluorines on it now, and fluorine is the most electronegative. So it's going to have the fluorines are going to have the partial negative, and the carbons are going to have the partial positive, or the left carbon is going to have that partial positive. The right carbon is still going to remain partial positive because of the oxygen above it, which is greater electronegativity, and will have the partial negative value. Um, now let's think about this OH bond. How does this like? How does the pull of the carbons have an effect on the OH bond? Well, we know that the oxygen is going to have a partial negative, and the hydrogen is going to have a partial positive. Uh, um, partial positive. But because on the left molecule, there the one carbon has a partial negative and one partial one has a partial positive. This will have a less polarizing difference between the oxygen than the one on the right. The one on the right, the two carbons are both partial positive. So that so that oxygen in the center is really ha pulling electrons from all directions more than the one on the left. This actually is called the inductive effect. The inductive effect where a atom is sur completely surrounded by almost po a positive kind of energy, a partial positive, so that makes this uh, even more polarized. So it's actually the one on the right because the fluorine's making it more, um, the OH bond more polarized. That's all for today. Thank you so much for watching this video about polar covalent bonds. For more videos and more information, please visit www.chemistrytalk.org.